Let's begin with a question. This is not a rhetorical question, but it's not the quiz type question either. Okay, so sometimes I start with a with a quiz question. This is uh, this is more of a personal, soul searching type of question. All of us, all of us, no exceptions. All of us lived this week on the strength of another. We looked for strength, for power, someplace. So my question is, where did you source your strength? And I think if we consider ourselves, there's probably those of us in this room that have a tendency to kind of go through their day, their week, right? Hour by hour, day by day, week by week. You're in a season right now where things go pretty well. Not a lot of challenges, not a lot of stress. And so maybe you're living in your own strength. Maybe you don't really even consider where power is coming from. And then there's others on the other side of that spectrum who are struggling deeply. Think about power or strength. What are we talking about? There's a whole cornucopia of types of strength that we need. We need physical strength. And again, some of us are sleeping really well right now and waking rested and eating food and feeling energized and going to exercise and are feeling strengthened. And other of us are sick, physically worn out and weary. But both were living according to some power, or some strength, and were looking somewhere for the source of it. You think about emotional strength. Some of us are just inclined to be kind of steady, even-handed, even-keeled, just kind of that calm disposition, not anxious ordinarily about much, and maybe just don't have much to be anxious about. Life is going fairly well. Your plans are unfolding more or less how you hope that they would. No great tragedy has struck you. And so life's pretty easy. And then others of us are so bereft of inner strength, we look inside ourselves and find no inner resources whatsoever to face the trials that befall us day by day, week by week, sometimes hour by hour. Spiritual strength. Some in this room feel they're doing really well spiritually. Some will think, you know, no, I'm, I'm, I've been reading my Bible and spending some time in prayer and serving in this and that capacity. I haven't had any real sin struggles, no great temptation that's overtaken me. Not saying I'm perfect. I'm, of course, we all sin, but, you know, by and large, I've had peace. I've had joy, comfort. Things are going pretty well. And then still others on the other side are feeling absolutely weary spiritually. They're just wondering... What is God doing? Just questioning His goodness, filled with, with temptation, and maybe there's just that sin that just keeps coming back up in your life and you struggle to defeat it, and it raises its ugly head, and you fall to it, and you repent, and you turn, and, and you fight, and you war against it, and yet it just seems to always gain the mastery over you. Or there's, of course, the sin of unbelief, right? We're filled with doubts about God's goodness and His promises to us in Christ through the gospel. And is He really pleased with me? Does He really delight in me? Does He smile upon me as His child? Is He not disappointed with me right now? And so we question and we doubt and we wrestle with these doubts. And maybe even just the fact that we have doubts makes us feel like we're a very inferior Christian. So we're all of us on both sides. And then, of course, Sometimes we're in between the two or we vacillate, depends hour to hour, day to day. You know, you can start out and get on the right side of the bed in the morning and by noon you start coming apart at the seams, right? Physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually. But all of us, no matter where you found yourself right now or this week at various times throughout the week, you were living upon a power, upon a strength. My question is, what is the source of your power? It's the source of your strength. Is it something that you're looking within and finding it within? Or when you look within, you find nothing. Are you living upon your own resources or upon the resources that maybe that someone else gives you? Are you leaning upon other people? Still more of us might even say, well, no, no, I'm, I'm living upon God's power and His strength. I just wonder, do we even know what that really means? 
you know, in our prayers, often we go to God, especially when we recognize. Because again, there's several people in here right now that probably just don't even know you need strength. <laughs> you don't even know you need power, right? Things are just going well and you're not conscious of it. But when you sense your need, when you feel that inside of me, I have no resources of my own, we naturally, even as unbelievers do, cry out to God, help. But do we even know what we're asking for when we ask God for power, for strength? So what do you think? This week, where are you looking for strength? Anybody want to be honest? Where are you going to for power? Whether you're in good times or bad. I think if everybody had to give an answer, their first answer is going to be Christ. Okay? Well, yeah, Sunday school answer. It's yeah. A given, right? <laughs> but, and personally, even in my life, and I'm, I mean, I'm retired, mm -hmm. I don't bear the burden after 47 years of working, other than what we just heard in Sunday school, yep. that I need to go find a job. <laughs> <laughs> I've called upon a few brothers in Christ just to pray about a meeting I had today mm. with someone yeah. uh, just for strength. Yeah. And I, I mean, and Jimmy and I were just talking about it. It's, I don't even want to go into detail, but it was going to be, it could be combative. Mm. And I don't want my old self coming out. Yeah. And thank the Lord, I didn't even get close. I mean, it went, I thought it went smooth. Maybe the answer wasn't what I wanted, but... Mm -hmm. I thought it went really well. Yeah. But I, I, you know, when we say that we, we just draw on Christ, I think we're told to exhort and build up and pray for one another. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, me, I'm going to reach out kind of to my inner circle or whatever and ask brothers to pray about it. Yeah. Right. But how important it is that when you're reaching out for that brother that they're listening. Put on the brakes. It's time to listen. Yeah. And not always coming back with a Bible verse is going to be the the strengthening. I mean, God gives us many means what we at times don't trust hmm. for some odd reason. Like we trust in our prayers, but why would we trust our church then? <clears throat> Has anybody here done anybody wrong? No. You know, it's that fleshy, oh, someone's going to know something about me. That, uh, you're afraid that you're going to be table talk somewhere. So mm. It just needs to be gone. Mm. I think the struggle too, if you're, especially if you're a parent or have a family, even if you don't work outside of the home or if you're working out the, outside of the home, it's time. Mm -hmm. You know, like I have to, I have to do and God, like I have to do it, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like God's not going to just rain acts on me. Mm -hmm. So there are things that as a person who is employed, you, you have to perform your job. And, and time is precious and just survival mode sometimes you don't have the time make the time or I'll sit down and pray and I'll crash I'll, mm -hmm. I'll just fall asleep um, and I used to keep a prayer journal periodically I still do that just to keep myself awake you know when I'm praying or I'll just uh, you know on, on my way mm. to school or something I'll say you know, be in this day, help me with patience, help me find empathy and, you know, but it, it, it's quick and it's heartfelt, but I don't have the time to, to do because I'm exhausted just right. from yeah. getting by. And I think that's the case for everybody yeah. mm -hmm. who is in the workforce. Sure. It's a struggle. Look real quick. We're going to continue this conversation, but maybe this will help some of us to think through this a little bit. So Colossians 1, we're going to read verse... 11 is what we're going to focus on tonight, but remember Paul is telling the Colossians, this church that he did not plant, he's never met these people, right? This church was established by Epaphras, and so he's writing to them, and so writing to us, people he's never met, right? 2,000 years later, and as he writes to the saints to the church, he is telling them how he has prayed for them. Specifically, what has his prayer been ever since he heard that they heard the gospel, and came to trust in Christ, and were filled with this hope of the gospel. What has his prayer been? And so pick up at verse 9, but the verse we're going to focus in on is 11. Verse 9, And so from the day we heard, we've not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will, God the Father's will, in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, 
So here's the reason why he's praying that they would be filled with this knowledge of God's will and wisdom and understanding so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. And then verse 11, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might. Why? What's the purpose? Why do we need the strengthening? For all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father. So that's Paul's prayer for the church. And verse 11, he says he's praying that we would be strengthened with all power according to God's glorious might, which is just another way of saying in accordance with or in proportion to, right? Proportion to what? God's glorious might. That to the degree that God has this glorious might, we would be so strengthened in Him and by Him and through Him. But why? Why do we need this kind of strengthening, this all power? Well, for all endurance and patience with joy. So maybe to reframe my question a little bit, do you have anything going on in your day, in your week, in your life right now that would require endurance and patience and where you're struggling to have joy yes. in the midst of it. Okay, now I got some hands. Okay. So, Care to share briefly? So to answer your first question briefly. Yeah. So yes, we I turn to the Lord. My temptation is not to make an idol of my wife. Okay. I adore my wife. I think she's great. But Never turn any like don't make Pastor Tom, don't mm. make you, don't make anybody an idol. Put oh they're so wonderful. No, yeah, they're just people. Yeah, fallen, broken sinners who are only if you see anything good in them, that's the grace of God. That's good. So the worst thing I can do is put unfair expectations on Chuki, because of course she's going to let mm. unfair expectations. They're not reasonable. They're unfair. They're, they're right. you're wanting more and you're turning mm-hmm. it into an idol, which is terrible. Mm. So don't do that, Craig. So tie that real quick. So, I know what you're saying, but tie that to where so, you're looking for power and yes. strength. So when I'm looking for confidence or comfort or reassurance, that's got to come from Christ. Yeah. That's got to come from the Lord my God. Now, there are times, this is where I stumble or can get off track, is when God uses my wife. So then, wretched man of them, right? I, I misuse the gift of God. Yeah. He who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. And here's God's favor from the Lord. And then I blow it because I go, oh, that's great. So tell me how wonderful I am. And, blah. and I, the focus gets off of God. And then I swear sometimes I go, I'm going to let her let you down just so you remember. It's me, Craig. It's yeah. me. Yeah. It's me. It's not her. It's me. So I have to remember the good that I find in my wife is the only good that I can find in myself. It's all the Lord our God. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for bringing that up because that's really helpful. That is one of the sources of strength. So generally we, we look inside ourselves. We can turn to God which we're going to talk about again. I'm not so convinced that we really know what that is sometimes. Just remember, idolatry at its heart is to look to the creation for what only God can give you. Okay. That's mentioned in this covetousness, which is idolatry. Yes, exactly. Now, there's a sense in which, you know, obviously two lie together, they they stay warm. A three-cord rope is not easily broken. So together we're stronger than we are apart. And that's by God's design in marriage. However, there's a way that we can, in an idolatrous fashion, look to your spouse or look to other people as a source of strength and power beyond what they're able to give you and not designed by God to give you. Exactly. We've started doing evening devotions with the, that book that Dr. Beaky wrote. And I find that's the highlight of my day. And I really look forward to it because I have a willing wife and we're in the Word of God and we sing, and actually my favorite part not to belittle the Word of God, but when we sing together, when we worship together, I find it a very rich experience. Yeah. It's beautiful. And I never knew we could have that. Mm. Mm. But how wonderful it is that, see, that's me doing my job, and I'm grateful that my wife supports me in that. that we, and, and it's only good because the Lord is there, mm. and He's blessing us because we're seeking Him. Yeah. Yeah. So the power unequivocally comes from the Lord. Mm. Go ahead, brother. 
Yeah, um, I'm currently going through a divorce, and uh, we've been separated for like a few years, but I got saved back in December, so ever since I got saved, I see my marriage different now, and I've been trying to reconcile it, and it's sometimes it gets there, and then she just like veers off, mm. and then now she actually she actually filed and everything. Mm. She's saying until I get my own place that I only see my kids whenever she feels like it, yeah. which is why I haven't been bringing them. I've been having to seek out the Lord more because I realize that it's highly emotional because I love my kids, mm. and uh, I tend to feel a lot of like vengeful like thoughts or like hatred in my heart yeah. uh, against that. And then um, I realized that it's not good. And so, like, mostly at nighttime, I'll go off and just walk and just 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 talk to God, mm -hmm. and just and just literally cry out for Him to uh, renew my heart and open it. And um, you know, because these thoughts they don't ever lead to anything good. And even mm -hmm. though what she's doing is not right, um, and I have the right to be upset, I can't let it make me like bitter mm -hmm. or you know like hateful. And so I have to cry out for God for Him to help me forgive her, right. and then also like deal with it until I guess God solves it or makes it right, you know. So until then, I'm in this trial, yeah. and some days are good. Like like right now, like my mental state is good because mm -hmm. you know I come to God and I recognize my weakness. I ask Him for my daily needs and yeah. you know uh, protect me from temptation, all that stuff. And I realize when I don't do that often, I tend to you know, a veer to the left a little bit and start thinking or like entertaining thoughts in my head a little mm -hmm. too long. And I'm like, okay, okay, stop, mm -hmm. you know. That's why I have to call for power from God himself because in me alone, I start getting angry and it's like, yeah. mm -hmm. that's, that's not going to help nobody. It's gonna you, you're a perfect target for the devil. Mm -hmm. When yeah. that void of Christ isn't filled, he's going to look to slip in on that. You have yeah. to know he, he doesn't stop. Yeah. He goes around like a ravenous lion. That means he's never fulfilled in what he wants. Yeah. You yeah. know that you know that's around. Yep. And your flesh never gives up either, you know? Yeah, yeah. Peter says that you the desires of your flesh, your flesh waging war against your soul. Eric, you said um when you entertain bad thoughts too long. That is what I've been struggling with too. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that. I've been struggling with headaches for about four weeks now, and today mm. I look forward to being with you all. I really do. Friday nights are a favorite, but getting the house to not so lived in <laughs> was extra hard today. Uh, I even needed to take a nap, and mm. then I feel like I'm failing him. I didn't make enough food today, so everybody was hungry. You know, just mm. the whole thing piles up, and I think the things that I was turning to for strength today was, did I eat enough? Did I drink enough? Maybe if I take a nap, I'll be better. Maybe if I don't talk about it, because Matt was trying to pursue me, and I was like, I'm not talking about this. I'm just, I don't want to talk about it. There's too much to do. I just want to work. And I'm recognizing that there's this default to, if I do think about it and I do talk about it, then more of the chores will pile up and then I'll be even more stressed and flustered. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make me feel better, but it does when, <laughs> when it's identifying and putting his finger on the pulse of the actual problem so that I don't keep running in my own strength. But I denied that all day. Yeah, and uh, when I try to be nice to her, like when I, I try to like, get her to let me see my kids, you know, I, I, I try so hard, she always just, you know, with her attitude, Dismiss. and then uh, I always remember the story of uh, Jacob and Esau, how uh, Jacob tried to uh, woo his, like, woo his brother so he won't yeah. hurt him, and God got angry at Jacob, saying, you don't think I can turn his heart, you know, in your favor, and I, I, keep, I keep remembering that, I said, okay, God has control, so instead mm. of me trying so hard and failing, yeah. I just, I just bring the matters to God and say, God, can you please open up her heart so I can see my kids? And then she texts me like an hour ago, and I can mm. pick them up on Praise Sunday. Praise God. So they'll be with me on Sunday. So awesome. God, yeah. it helps me trust God and uh, n knowing that despite how horrible things are, especially in the stories of the Bible, how bad the situations are, God is always good through it out. And if, if I don't question his goodness, like, like the Israelites did in the uh, desert, right. that uh, you know God is going to eventually... Um, deliver his promise that right there right mm -hmm. so if you believe he's good right mm -hmm. see uh, Sarah just mentioned I think we kind of summarized part of what you said you did today where you looked is really to kind of distract mm -hmm. right 
you just stay busy. You ever find yourself there? You just got to stay busy. Right? And I don't want to stop moving. I don't want to stop working. I don't want to stop. Because if I stop and things get still, I'm left alone with my thoughts. Night. Right? And that's what happens at night. Right? You lay your head on the pillow. And then next thing you know, it's just like, <laughs> whoa, I've been avoiding that all day. Right? And so that's kind of going for a source of strength. How do I get through this day? I distract myself. Same thing happens like when you're mourning. Like mm. Some people, like, you know, people go to work and, no, no, you shouldn't be here. Like, you just right, lost right. somebody. And the reaction is, no, last thing I want to do is be home and still, like, yeah, keep me yeah. going, keep me active. Otherwise, I'm going to crumble. For me personally, like, when it comes to power and where am I getting my strength from, I almost view it as, like, when I run on my own strength, I, it's like there's a limiter on me. Yeah. And once I get out of my own way and I let God do what... <laughs> God has been wanting to do and bless me with this whole time then it's just like the power meter like goes through the roof and I'm just like if I only submitted and just had faith all along right. your power would have been here for me but I got in the way of God's power Yeah, it is a constant thing getting in like God's way Right, and that's why I started out by saying like all of us no matter what whether you're flying high or you're laid low you're living off of some power some strength somewhere Right, and you might not even think of it, you not even be aware of it, okay, and not cognizant of it at all. But all of us are, and when we are turning in the good moments or the bad, when you are turning to other sources of power to endure with patience and joy, it's ultimately because we doubt the power that God would give us. We doubt that power, it's a form of gospel unbelief, right. And I'm not believing either that God's good, good enough to give me the strength that I need or to turn these circumstances in my favor, right? Or just to supply what I am lacking. Again, mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually. And I mean, think about how offensive that is to God, right? So think about it this way. There are thousands, like tens of thousands of biological and chemical processes going on in your body right now you don't even know they happen. You're not even aware of them. You can't perceive them, let alone control them. One hepatocyte, it's the cell that makes up your liver tissue, performs over a thousand known functions. If anyone in this room could name 10 of them, I will be so impressed, right? Thousand functions that we know about. You don't even know what they are, let alone can you turn them on and off, like, you know? And your heart is beating in your chest and you're gonna go to sleep tonight lay your head on the pillow, fall asleep, who's going to keep you breathing? Mm. Right? Your blood pumping. You can't keep yourself alive. You can't kill yourself without some other kind of instrument. You can't just be like, and eh, I'm done. I'm leaving this world, right? Shut the switch off. It doesn't work that way. And yet we think that God is not able or willing. It's always one of those two, right? Or both. He's either not able to give us the strength we need to be the, our source of power, or he's not willing Either because he's not good, or maybe we think because he's good, he's not willing because of who I am. I'm disqualified for him to do anything good for me. So I said earlier, you know, I sometimes wonder if we really know, if we really know what we're asking for when we go to God and ask him for power, as we all do, right? We all at some point, as you said, sometimes it's like, no, I'm going to go, I'm going to go, I'm going to go, my own strength here. But eventually, God's like, no, you're not. Like, he's going to bring you, because he loves you, you're his child, he's going to bring you to the end of yourself. He doesn't allow you to just keep running in your own strength. Eventually, you will stumble, you will fall, you will fall apart at the seams, right? You're going to crumble under the weight of something. You're going to find yourself bereft of strength, and then he picks you up, right? It's just what happens. I mean, we live these cycles. Yeah, right. We live these cycles and we, we get to that place where we're finally just like, okay, Lord, help me, help me. But do we really know what we're asking when we ask for help, when we ask for power, when we seek him for power? I was trying to think of some analogies of like other ways that we use that expression. Like, do you, re you know, I'm not sure you know what you're asking for. Turn to Mark 10. Mark 10, 35. Keep your finger here in Colossians, of course. This will be brief, but here's just one example that we find in the scriptures of a similar kind of thing. Mark 10, 35. 35. So this is a story of James and John, 
sons of thunder, sons of Zebedee, they are going to come and ask Jesus a question. If you read Matthew's account, I think it's a chapter 20 or 21, 22, something like that. Their mommy goes to Jesus for them. It's even worse, I think, but <laughs> Mark, Mark, Mark was trying to save face on their behalf a little bit, maybe, I don't know. But <laughs> Mark says, verse 35, And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. Sometimes my children have asked me a question like that. <laughs> and he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. Jesus said to them, You do not know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? What is Jesus saying when he says, like, you, don't, you don't know what you're asking? Well, they would, might reply and go, of course we do. I, I thought we were pretty plain. I want to sit at your right hand and James wants to sit at your left in your kingdom and your glory. Like, that's what we're asking. What does Jesus mean? Yeah, but you don't know how that comes. You don't know. Like, if I answer that request with an affirmative yes, you don't know how you end up at my right and left hand. You got to drink the cup I drink. You got to be baptized with the baptism I'm going to be baptized with. Right? You must go to the cross and die. That's what has to happen. So you don't understand, like, yeah, you understand the end, what you're asking for, right? But the way it comes about, what that really means, James, John, you, you don't know what you're asking. Now, not in the exact same way. I don't think it's nearly as negative as this story, but just going back to Colossians now. When we come to God and ask Him for help, when we come to Him and pray like Paul prayed, Lord, strengthen me with all power according to your glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy. When we pray that to God or, or when Paul prays it on our behalf, do we really know what he's asking for? Do we really understand how this comes? Well, I think what would be helpful for us here is to look at a similar prayer in the book of Ephesians. So flip a few pages to Ephesians, it'll be to the left, two books to the left, Ephesians chapter 3. Now when we were in Galatians, we spent a lot of time in Romans 6, 7, and 8. By the end it was kind of just a joke because it was like if you didn't know we were going to turn there, you should have just had a bookmark in both sides, right? Because those chapters of Romans and the book of Galatians are very, very similar. One's almost a commentary on the other. Well, Ephesians and Colossians, not quite the same thing, but there's a ton of parallels to the point where like many commentators will say that they, they'll call them sister books. Right? They're sister books, and some have even speculated that they really were the same book and got edited by somebody at some point, and I mean, that's a bunch of hogwash, but yeah, you know. But that's how similar they are in some of the content that they deal with. But let's just read together and see some parallels here, because in Paul's prayer in Ephesians chapter 3, he fleshes out, he fills out, I think, a bit more for us what it means to ask God that he would strengthen us with all power for endurance and patience with joy. Okay? So, let's take a look at chapter 3, verse 14. What in the world does that sound? It's like a little Irish jig or something. What are we doing? All right, Ephesians 3, beginning at 14. Again, Paul praying for the church. He says, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of His glory... Now that sounds familiar, right? We, Paul prayed in the Colossians that it would be according to His glorious might. Okay? Here he says that according to the riches of His glory, God may grant you to be strengthened with power. Okay, see? Parallel there, right? Same prayer. According to God's riches, glory, His glorious might, praying that God would strengthen us with power. But then look how it, this power comes. Through His Spirit in your inner being. Now, keep your finger here, okay? We're going to come back to Ephesians. But flip to John 16. Now, as you're turning there, let me ask a question. What does it mean, or what do you think of? What do we generally think of? when we think of like, okay, the Spirit is going to strengthen me. And what does that look like in your life? You pray to God, I need strength, Lord. Strengthen me with power. And Paul says, it's going to be through His Spirit. How's that come, though? Like, what happens? 
What are you expecting God to do for you or in you by His Spirit? What does that What does that mean? I don't have the correct term, but I, I, whenever whenever it happens to me, I always say that uh, God is pressing on my heart. That's, that's that's the way that I express. Mm-hmm. Okay. Pretty much uh, all the anxiety and worries, and I guess the uh, the negative feelings I get, it like washes away, and mm. I feel very soft, mm. and very uh, light, mm. and I can and I can overcome whatever okay. I'm trying to. Uh, overcome like whatever feeling or situation yeah okay anybody want to add to that i think for me it's uh pretty much what he's saying in the trust you have in okay God, that, that's how i feel i know that god's going to take care hmm. of may not be the way i want it <laughs> yeah but he's going to take care of the situation okay in, in that trust that the both of you are saying do you feel wisdom do you feel strength in his word do you what what are the feelings that go with this strength do you feel more capable to uh, handle because of putting yes. all on Christ. I do have a strength, a feeling of strength through Christ. Right. But is it an illumination of yeah. His Word coming alive, mixing with your spirit? Yeah. I like um, I like uh, anime, hmm? and I like to always like whenever I talk to my non-believing friends who also watch anime. I like to re- reference that Dragon Ball Z, like mm-hmm. like. Whatever you see Goku with his super saying and his yeah. power illuminating, I yeah. feel like that. Okay. I, feel, I, I literally feel like I'm like empowered. Like if I really wanted to, I, I could run a thousand miles right now and not even pass up. Like yeah. it's, it's it's real powerful. Like mm-hmm. that, that makes sense. I'm I got you. Saying, I'm, I'm trying to use a, a worldly analogy. I got you. I don't, maybe I'm, I don't know how anybody else did, but <laughs> not many people know what you're talking about. But yeah. No, I think we got the gist though. Safe. Yeah. You feel safe too. Okay. Yeah. I feel safe. Yeah, Brother Craig. <laughs> Isn't it more an alignment of our will with God's? Okay, I would agree to that. I'm stressed out about stuff and I pray. I think ultimately what I'm really asking, if, if I want God to change a circumstance, it's ultimately because I want what I want to be in line with His will. Yeah. yeah. And Seeking His wisdom. Well, and this, mm-hmm. this is why the qualifier is always, but not my will, yours be done. Yes. The will of the Lord Yes. Because there are times I know, I mean, I'm so grateful for the, all the stuff that God said no to. Hmm. I am now. Right. I wasn't... In retrospect. Look, yeah. Oh, yeah, looking yeah. back, <laughs> or even the stuff that doesn't happen. Like, we were driving along, my wife happened to be mm-hmm. driving, and... The light screen, she doesn't go right away, and the guy just soars through. Now, I'm very grateful that my wife paused, because it would not have been good Hmm. had she not. So there's there's that. But then there are the times when I I can look back, you know, because hindsight's 100%. I can look back and go, wow, I'm sure glad you said no or not yet. Mm -hmm. Like, all these things that would have been probably really resulting in terrible results in my life yeah and and god said no yeah but that's an answer yeah, yeah. Oh, that's, god yeah, that's a an very answer. good answer right. the answer sometimes so, is no yeah yeah so now when i pray it's like well this is what i want but only if it's your will yeah because i don't want it if it's not your will because like i've learned the hard way or the good way or the long way it's like yeah okay. you know you don't want your will you want god's will Steve, you got something? Oh, just, uh, could you repeat the question real quick? Yeah, absolutely. So we saw in Ephesians 3 in the prayer that Paul prays that we would be strengthened, right, in our inner being, but by the Spirit or through the Spirit. And so before we look at what exactly does that mean, I'm just asking kind of like, what do we think of? What comes to mind when you think like being strengthened? The fruit of the Spirit. Okay. Giving me the fruit of the Spirit to endure and to um, make it through all the challenges that we face as a simple person in a simple world. Um, and uh, but it's I think it's through the knowledge of Christ, right? Yeah. Like that's what we kind of looked at in the past. Yeah. The knowledge of Christ. As we grow in the knowledge of Christ, the fruit of the Spirit starts to develop in us, and that's how we endure. Right. How we persevere through the power of the Holy Spirit, and um, you know, for His glory and um, for the gospel, right? Perfect segue. All right. Read John, chapter. 16 verse, we'll start at 12, just for a little context. 
Jesus speaking to his disciples, if you recall, his disciples are very anxious right now because he just told them he's going to be leaving and where he's going. They can't go at this very moment, but they know the way to which he's going. Okay, they will follow him eventually. All that is happening in chapters 13, 14, 15, 16 is Christ. The things that he's choosing to say to them at this hour is preparing their hearts to endure with patience and endurance, right, with joy, what they're about to experience with Christ being handed over to the Gentiles and being whipped and flogged and mocked and ridiculed and ultimately crucified, okay? They're going to experience that. Their, their Lord is going to be in the grave for three days, and they're going to be wondering what on earth is happening, God. I thought this was the Messiah, right? They're going to be filled with all kinds of doubts and questions and unbelief, and He's preparing them. And so in verse 12, He says, I still have many things to say to you, which is just as an aside. He says, but you cannot bear them now. Well, when's he going to tell them? Like that, that, that was a sign to them. Hey, this isn't the end, right? I'm coming back. But he's about to end this whole discourse. He says, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will do what? Glorify me. For he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore, I said, he will take what is mine and declare it to you. So we learn from this verse that the ministry, the ministry of the Spirit is to glorify Christ. Which, as an aside, when we look at charismania and the, just the nonsense that happens in churches in the charismatic and Pentecostal movements, and you look at all of this, you know, running up and down the aisles and people falling over and all this stuff, and you just go, how is this pointing me to Christ? Mm. Where is Christ being glorified? And how, what way is he being glorified through that? Okay, nothing that's going on, all it's doing is pointing to the person who's having the experience or the guy on the pulpit on the platform. But where's, how is this pointing me to Christ and glorifying Him, exalting Him? A verse that I was thinking of, I just looked it up, it was Acts 1.8, and it says, um, But you will, will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses. Yes. Right? And mm -hmm. it to be a witness, right? We are to glorify yep. Christ. We're to bring that's why himself. you get the power, right? Yeah. right? You're getting the power from the Spirit so that you can glorify Him, bear witness to Him. Absolutely. Thank you. So back to Ephesians then. And let's continue with this prayer. Understand, this is why I bring this up. Again, when I said we cry out to God, we ask Him, strengthen me, Lord. Right? I need all power that I might endure with patience and joy. But do we really know what we're asking for? We might know the end result we're seeking. Right. I just I, I just want to get through this, Lord. I just want to keep my sanity right now. But do we know how it comes about? What tangibly are we expecting God's going to do? And I think sometimes, maybe a lot of the times, what we're really asking for is God to just do one of these. Yeah. Right. Just he's up there and he's oh, heard the prayer. Snap the finger. Boom. Empowered. Now, listen, I want to be clear. I'm not saying that there are not times, moments, moments in the day, one minute where God just, he strengthens us. And it almost is as if he just snapped a finger and it's just inexplicable. OK, so don't walk out of here going, man, man it's just. But the normative means, the typical, usual means by which God is strengthening us and what we should mean when we pray, as Paul meant when he prayed, Lord, strengthen them with all power according to your glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy is it's going to come through the Spirit who glorifies the Son. It's not, hey, I just, Lord, I just need you to just speak a word up there. Snap the fingers. Just make it happen. No. What we're asking for then, we're about to see, you're asking for a greater sight of Christ. That's what you're asking for. So, Ephesians 3 uh, back to, we'll just again pick up at 14. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of His glory He may grant you to be strengthened with power through His Spirit in your inner being. Again, but how? Not by snapping fingers, right? Not just by speaking a word from heaven and then it just whew, infused with power. But what we ought to be asking is this, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, 
being rooted and grounded, right? There's a, a sense when you just think of being rooted and grounded like a tree that can endure great winds. Anybody who lived through any kind of hurricanes here since you've been in Florida and just see like, how are their trees still standing, mm -hmm. right? I mean, you see the palm tree and it's just all the way to the ground. The thing flexes and pops back up when it's all over or the majestic oaks and they're just no big deal. You know, they lost some branches, lost some leaves, but they're not toppled over. Why? Because they have a deep, expansive root system that is grounding them and just holding on to the earth and they don't go anywhere. And so us being rooted and grounded in love, well, whose love, read on, may have strength to comprehend, to understand with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. So that's what you're asking for. When you ask, when Paul says, we're praying, I'm praying for you that you may be filled with all power according to his glorious might, right? When I say according to, again, we're talking about in proportion to. God has infinite riches of glory and power at his disposal, and he can give it to you. That's to be filled with all his fullness. And so if you want to be filled with all his fullness, again, this is not because God just by his spirit infuses it into you in a moment in time through the snapping of a finger or a speaking a word. Again, not to say that there aren't times when he just strengthens us in a great time of need, but the way that he typically does this and what we should mean when we are crying out in times of great distress, Lord, I don't know how I'm going to make it through this. How can I endure and have patience and maintain my joy in the midst of this struggle? Or maybe it's not even a struggle. Maybe it's just a good day. Day's going well. I think often when we perceive or we think that, oh, wow, like God just did it. Yeah. What we're failing to recognize is all of the sanctification, all of the you work, got it. all the trials yeah. and testing of our faith that led up to that moment where we go, oh, I've been delivered. It took a year or yeah, months. Or, those were all means. Yeah. yeah. Means that hey, he has used. And once again, if we think about over here in John 16, that's also choosing their own way to speed of sanctification. Yeah. <laughs> Not trust, you know, it's a nice way of saying you got a lot to learn. Yeah. You know, and even think about what was said throughout the Bible is you're not going to understand, hmm. you know, why things were said in parables. So the people would, that were with Christ would have an understanding. Not yeah. just hiding anything. But is never expect the rate that you're being moved ahead through the gospel to be anything but God's job. Yeah. Not yours. Mm. Yeah. In other words, if you've ever been in this position or talked to somebody in the position where they're where you're feeling kind of like, God, what's the hold up? Why aren't I not further along? Right. You know, you're the one that's to sanctify me. Why am I why am I not further along? It's like, well, hold on, pump the brakes. <laughs> Do not presume that you yeah. are desiring to be sanctified more than God is desiring to sanctify you. But right. That, that like, I would, I would be holy, God, but you just aren't doing it. No. What happened in that, and that was so important, you yeah. said that you're pointing to you yeah, exactly. and not to God. You're making yourself. You're, you're not equal or greater than it. It's never yeah. going to happen. Right. And even if thoughts are like that in prayers, then they, shouldn't, they won't be answered. Yeah. What you just said, I just want to recap that. So important. You're absolutely right. When you have, you have that moment where it's just like, man, the Lord just strengthened me. He didn't snap his fingers. Right. That was the outworking of years or months or days, you know, hours. We're going to look back one day if you really look at your life and realize, oh, yeah, he was preparing me all along. Right. He was working in me through the means of grace, through the sermons I've been hearing and through the times in his word and through prayer and other people's prayers for me and the sights of Christ that I had along the way and then bringing them to mind. Maybe not in that exact moment, but. But again, you, it, it's always tied to trust, as Gaila said, some level of faith in Christ. I think there's a very interesting parallel going on with how we perceive prayer mm -hmm. and our perspective on health and medicine. Hmm. So if you look at traditional approach to medicine, 
it's um, more of a process and you don't treat the symptoms, you find the cause. When Lazarus, when Jesus on purpose detains mm -hmm, mm -hmm. himself and says, Lazarus is asleep, and they're like, oh, that's good. He's <laughs> going to rest and get better. If it had been, in our time, it would have been, why isn't he at work? He should just take some, you know, Tylenol or whatever, or, or suppress his, his mucus and, you know, so he doesn't have a runny nose and, and go to work. In a similar way, as things are changing, I'm hoping that just as we figure out, no, no, we, we've got to uh, go for the cause, not the symptom. It's the same way with our prayers. So what are we really asking? When I right. ask God, give me patience, right, right. am I asking, so Lord, <laughs> set up trials and yeah. tribulations so right. that I have to stand in line for a really long time right. Right. so that I'm going to grow. You don't know what you're life. asking for. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. That's really what I meant, right? Yeah. If I'm asking for patience, that means, so you, Craig, are going to have to yeah. acquire patience, and it will continue to happen, and yeah. if you keep failing, you're going to be possibly standing in line or waiting on something for a very long time. Yeah. Right? Like, there's all kinds mm -hmm. of ways that God will, okay, so I'm going to set up this process of sanctification, because that's what I'm really asking, or yeah. whatever, you know, if I want God to bless my business, Oh, so you want me to set it up so you have to work long hours and get a bit of return, and hopefully, and that's going to continue to grow. But you're going to work a lot hmm. and pray a lot. Okay, great. That's a, that's a great right. prayer, Craig. That's an excellent request. Yeah. And along the way, in any of those sorts of prayers, you know, like you said, praying for patience, and then, the, well, the Lord uses means in your life to bring you into circumstances where you're going to be tried, and you're going to probably fail a lot in being patient. But having to sit in traffic all the time is not going to make you a patient person. Ultimately, in any way that glorifies God, that might be the circumstances God uses, but ultimately you're going to need a sight of Christ. right? Or if you pray, Lord, deliver me from my idols. Well, that's a dangerous prayer. Let me just tell you, that's a dangerous prayer if you mean it. right? And God answers it because usually He's going to identify idols you didn't even know you had, and He's going to rip them out of your hands in ways that you did not want. But again, God taking all your idols away, literally, like of your automobiles, your idol, and you get in an accident or something, like that doesn't actually take the idol away, right? It takes the physical idol away, but the idol in the heart's still there. And so it's still going to require a sight of Christ to strip it away from the heart, you see. So here in Ephesians 3, in this prayer, what does Paul point to? He says, that if we are to be strengthened, look at 16, if we're to be strengthened according to the riches of God's glory, if He's going to grant us to be strengthened with power in our inner being by His Spirit or through His Spirit, if the Spirit's going to work that in you, it's so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And then more specifically, that you, what does it mean that Christ dwells in my heart? That you being rooted and grounded in love, and again, this is in His love, may have strength so here's what you really need strength for, you see. This is what you need strength for. You need strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, right? There's this love of Christ that it surpasses knowledge. And he prays that you would be able to comprehend it, okay? That your mind could just be wrapped around this unfathomable love of Christ to you. To know it in all of its dimensions, its height and length and breadth, right? That you would know it. But it's unknowable. It's unknowable. You can't possibly know it all. And yet, that's his prayer. He says, no, but my prayer for you is that you would be strengthened in your inner man. That you'd be rooted and grounded in this unknowable love. That you would truly come to know it. And in that, to know who Christ is, have a sight of Christ. And now look at the confidence that Paul has in verse 20. He says, now to him, the Father, who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think. How? According to the power at work in us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Amen. So Paul is absolutely, he has built all of his hope and his confidence on the power that's at work within us through the Spirit of God. And that power that's at work is coming through setting our eyes on Christ. That through sights of Christ, we would come to know His love. We would come to know His love for us. Why? Again, I said it all comes down at the end of the day to is God able or is He willing? 
And you might be convinced that God's able. He has all power. But is he willing? Is he really willing? We'll go back to Colossians now and we'll wrap up with this. In this prayer in Colossians, let's just look upon Christ and see if this does not strengthen you. Verse 11, being strengthened with all power, chapter 1, verse 11, being strengthened with all power according to His glorious might, for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father. What has the Father done? Who is this Father He's speaking of? Who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light? Now, we've talked about this in Galatians. What is required for you to be an heir? To be one who's to receive an inheritance, what has to be true of you? Yes. You've got to be a son, right? Yeah. So you have to have some, some kind of relationship with the person who's giving up the inheritance, right? Who's supplying the inheritance. You've got to be a son. Okay. Well, whose son are you? Well, ultimately, in your flesh, you were born in the likeness of Adam. Genesis 5.3 interesting how you have this shift in language where Adam was made in the image and likeness of God and then he has Seth and it says he conceived him in his own image and likeness. So his sin nature is transferred to his son so that just by birth, by virtue of who he is in Adam, being born in Adam, he's a sinner. He sins because he's sinful and so he's not qualified to be a son of God that would inherit what God would give him. And that's who you are. You were born into that family. You were born, in fact, you're of the lineage of Cain. Right? You're the lineage of the devil. Jesus says your father is the devil. Your will by nature was to do the will of your father. And so that's what you're born into. And so you are, by nature, none of us were qualified to receive an inheritance, to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. Right? Saints, the holy ones, those who dwell in light. You don't know of yourself, you're not qualified for that. And yet, the glory of the gospel is that the very thing, your sin and your sin nature, all of your transgressions of the law, even this week how you have turned to things that God has made to get from it, what only God can give you. This week, you have looked to other sources of power, other sources of strength, and maybe you've gone to God, maybe you've gone to Him, but you weren't asking for what God would give you. You're just, Lord, snap your fingers up there, make it happen, right? You weren't asking for a sight of Christ because you doubted the power in that. And yet, this sin that dwells within us, even still, though it would be the very thing that disqualifies you from being an heir, but what does it say? He has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son. How? How? Because the thing that disqualified you from being an heir is the very thing that qualifies you for His grace. You see, what disqualifies you from being an heir by birth that sin within you, it's the very thing that qualifies you for His redeeming grace so that He can qualify you. But how did it come? It came in verse 14, the kingdom of His beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Mm -hmm. That redemption, brothers and sisters, came through the blood of Christ. Mm -hmm. Look down at verse 20. And through Him, this speaking God the Father acting through the Son, and through him God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. You see, it's sights of Christ. It's sights of Christ against the backdrop of your need. That's where the power comes from. Because that picture is a picture of the love of God to you. See. Even here, we have to remember that he's speaking in multiple places in Colossians 1 about the Father. Just look up at verse 2. It says, Grace to you and peace from God, our Father. How did he become your Father? 
He's also said in verse 3, he's the father of our Lord Jesus Christ. How is God your father? Do not think that God is this mean you know, God of the Old Testament who's just full of wrath and anger. And Jesus came to save the day and to reconcile us to, like Jesus is the one who reconciles to the father. He's making peace. He, the father is reconciling all things to himself. The father made peace with you through the blood of the cross. See, so all that Christ does, he says, I do only what I see the Father doing. I speak only what I hear the Father saying. He came to reveal the Father to us and the heart of the Father for us. And so the Father's heart towards you is revealed in the person of his Son. The Father's love, the height and the depth and the length and the breadth, this unknowable, incomprehensible love of God to you in Christ. That's what you need strength for. You need strength to comprehend that, to see it, and you see it in the person and the work of Christ. So when you're praying, when you cry out, Lord, I need strength, whether it's in the morning before anything happened, you know, when people ask me, I go into work or something or see somebody early in the day, how's your day going or how's it going? I'm like, too soon to tell, (laughs) right? (laughs) Sometimes sometimes you wake up, you don't know how it's going to go. It's like, I haven't been awake long enough, right? But you wake up in the morning, it's like, I'm going to pray, Lord, strengthen me. Pray that God will give you sights of Christ. He would show you Christ. He would reveal something more of his love to you through Christ. And when you're in that moment where you're just like, Lord, I, I, don't, I don't think I can go on. I don't think I can go on. I don't know how to endure this. I don't know how to endure this, how to go on with patience. How can I have any joy in these circumstances? Don't look to God to just snap his fingers. He may bring immediate relief. Don't get me wrong. Expect that he will. Pray that he will. Believe he's able and willing to give immediate relief. But don't expect that it just comes. Don't ask him to just do it irrespective of his normal means of showing you Christ. Does that make sense? Most definitely does. So that's what Paul's going to do. We talked about that a little bit last time as well. What we're going to see moving through this next chapter or so the rest of this chapter is that he's going to show us Christ. He's going to give us pictures of Christ. Why? Because he wants you to walk in a manner that's worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him. God desires that for you. You desire that if you're in Christ. Paul desires that for the church, that we would walk in a manner worthy of God, fully pleasing to him. You want to be that kind of person. You want to follow Christ in that way. And the only way for you to be sanctified, for you to grow and to be strengthened, is not by you turning inward to yourself, not by distracting yourself, not by turning to one another, or not just throwing shotgun prayers up to God, just expecting that He's just going to start snapping His fingers and strengthening you. It's by seeing Christ. That's how it comes. That's God's means. Why? Because He does everything for the glory of His Son. You're going to sing forever and ever, according to the book of Revelation, the song we're all singing, to the Lamb who was slain. To the Lamb who was slain, who ransomed a people for God from all over the world, be power and glory and honor and majesty. That's what you're going to sing. Everything exists for the glory of God through Christ. So is it any wonder that that's how the Spirit works? (laughs) And so that's what we should come to Him expecting. I want us to know what you're asking, all right? Know what you're asking when you go to Him. Because if you know what you're asking, it also helps because now you kind of know what to expect, what to look for, and maybe where you need to turn to a brother or sister who can point you to Christ, to His Word, to point you to Christ, to Scripture that you've memorized. Lord, bring Scripture to mind right now. I'm in a situation where you're at work, right? You're at work, and it's like, I can't just stop and read my Bible in this very moment, you know. Lord, bring sights of Christ to my mind from the Scriptures. Let me just meditate on Him in this moment of His love. Make sense? Thoughts, questions? Thank you for that, uh, because it's kind of hard to know what to pray for and how to pray. And, uh, you know, like, now I I know exactly what what to expect and how to uh, pray for it. Yeah. But... uh, even like this whole time where I didn't know what, what to pray for. Yeah. God is so gracious yeah, Ian. that even though I didn't know how to pray for it, the spirit groans to God without words. Yeah. And he knows what my heart really is asking for. Yeah. And he's so merciful that he still yeah. grants it, whether, I, whether I'm saying it right or mm-hmm. 
knowing what I'm even asking for, and he still, yeah. he still gives it. So. And just think of that as just another tangible expression of his love, right? Mm -hmm. You you wind yeah. up getting wrapped up and worried about the word, <coughs> the words that you're using, not the word Bible. <coughs> and just as the the emphasis on your prayers are being answered at times, and it will be quite overwhelming. Now, how are you going to navigate through what God has answered to you in prayer? You know, how do you use the wisdom? How do you exercise in the Holy Spirit for just for Christ to be seen? Hmm. And I think praying this way will also transform things in this way. What is the endurance that he's really calling us to, right? Finish strong. Yes, but I would say finish strong in this way. Endure in looking to Christ. And so when you start going through stuff, so often when we're living in our flesh in that moment, what happens? It distracts us from Christ. And so really, we should have a desperation of, Oh Lord, strengthen me now in the midst of this that I might see Christ. And also then having the sight of Christ is what's going to strengthen you, you see. So it's kind of cyclical. But right now I'm sensing, Lord, I got so much going on. I'm so distracted. I'm just completely shorn of strength on my own. I don't have the resources mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually to deal with this circumstance anymore. And in that moment, what tends to happen, you start to realize, like, I, I'm having a hard time seeing Christ. Right. That's why I need to do the strengthening. I'm desperate, Lord. Don't let my eyes depart from Christ. A verse that everybody probably knows, Philippians 4, 6 and 7, um, you know, um, be anxious for nothing, mm. but through everything, through prayer, petition, and thanksgiving, present your request to God and the peace of God, which surpasses yeah. all understanding, will guard your heart and mind and Christ Jesus. Jesus. Yeah. Thank you. But that, that's, that is an anchor right there in all the trials and tribulations that will happen. Yeah. Nobody is apart from any trial that God wants to test your spirit. Yeah. And the and, and blessed be of going through it. But also, if you're sharing with someone that you're confiding in, and they're giving you Oprah answers and not biblical <laughs> answers, you might want to yeah. um, ask for them to pray and think about what they said. <laughs> <laughs> An, an, here, here. an example that Matt always uses that I like is uh, like Peter walking on the water. As soon as he took his Lost eyes off of faith. Christ and looked at his feet, that's when he drowned. Yeah. Right? That, that's how we ought to be as well. Not hey, like him, but keeping yeah. our eyes on Christ. But and that's how we'll go through. Also, the brazenness that he had in to take Christ to, so, to, to the side <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and being called um, Satan. Yeah. You know, um, think about Job through all the, the trials, testing and uh, trials and tribulations, and tribulations that he was going through. And Christ, when God brought him above all things and said, "Where were you when I created all this?" That's what we need to remember. Yeah. He created all of it. He did it with a word. Right. right. He didn't have counsel. Right. He didn't have to say, "Hey, like we like to do. Hey, I just painted this room. You want to see it? It came out great." Uh, no. Uh, uh. No, he doesn't need that. It's just so far, so far above us. Well, and he didn't do it just with a word, but he also did it with a purpose. Yes. Yeah. Uh, exactly. And it was to all glorify him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's where uh, sometimes in this fleshy body, we like to take more of an accolade. Yeah. And instead of pointing to Christ. Yeah. You know, um, blessed be guidance and tutelage um, and, uh, to help understand better. Be careful what you pray for. Hmm. Well, before I uh, ask Brother Craig to close us, as you are reading Colossians, okay, I'm assuming you are, read Colossians this next week and take note of this next section that begins in verse 15. It's this famous section from 15 through 20. I don't know how long we will take in that section. I'm tempted to do it in one fell swoop or to pick it apart. But really look at the particular things that Paul turns our attention to about Christ. Colossians 1, 15 through 20. Yeah. I used the analogy before about if you have a fear of bridges, right? And I come to you and I say, well, listen, you know, this is irrational, right? You can cross this bridge. No big deal. Look at all the cars going over, etc. And you go, yeah, I, I understand that up here. But I just I can't I just don't trust it to carry me across. Well, the thing for me to do, if I have any hope of convincing you, is to point you to the bridge itself. 
right? Don't look at you. Don't look at your trembling hands and knees, right? And your sweat. Like, no, look at the bridge and consider, look at the engineering of it. Look at how it's built. Look at what it's made out of. Consider the maintenance routine that the city should be doing. Yeah, should be doing. (laughs) And um, look at those things, right? Look at the bridge, not yourself. Well, that's exactly what Paul's doing here. Paul is turning our eyes to particular things about Christ because if we look at the blueprint of the gospel and say, well, okay, I can see how that works. Yeah, but it's got to be this kind of Christ. This Christ is the only Christ that could truly ransom you, redeem you from your sins. He's the only one. right? And so that's what Paul's going to do for us. And again, why is he doing that in the grand scheme of the book? Because he's dealing with the people who want to turn somewhere else outside of the gospel for strength, for sanctification. They want to turn to man-made ideas, to philosophies and empty deceit and worldly traditions, to asceticism and severity of the body and to the law. They want to turn there, think of that's what's going to sanctify him. And he says, no, 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 it's Christ. Okay. The, the many examples he uses as we go on, you know, yeah. which really starts to eliminate everything outside of Christ. Mm. You know, don't take counsel. You know, why, why be judged on cleanliness and what's right mm-hmm. and let it be sad. Yeah. It's, it's important. I mean, it, you know, to, it need to be on the, on the rails. Yeah, as he says, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord in that same way, so walk in him, rooted and build up in him and establish in the faith. So, so you're saying don't set your eyes on your faith set your eyes on the object of your yes exactly mm-hmm. yep and don't read this section as like oh here's some fun little facts about jesus this is not just like a christology course we're going to do for the next however many weeks right that's not the point okay we're not just oh we're, let's see about jesus being he's divine and he's yeah okay but with a purpose okay well brother craig if you would be so kind father we thank you for gathering us this evening thank you for the attacks and opening of their home. And Father, we pray one simple thing, that we would see Jesus. Mm -hmm. So we ask you humbly that you would reveal your Son to us, Mm -hmm. so that we may know him and love him, and thereby appreciate all that you have done. Thank you, Father, for giving up your only Son, so that he will live a perfect life and sacrifice himself for our sins, the just for the unjust. Mm. And so, Father, we simply ask that we would know Jesus and strengthen our hearts, because if we really want that, we're going to go through sanctification, which is a nice way of saying trials. (laughs) And so, oh God, lead us through these. We trust you. Jesus said, I have not lost any that you have given to Mm. me. And that applies to us. You are the one who is faithful and true. And so, Father, we look forward to seeing how you're going to bring us through the trials that you set up for us, for our good and for your glory. So be glorified through us, Father, as you sanctify us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you.